Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, we are um, glad and so happy to have Bill Crisp, a wildlife control operator in Virginia. He's also, he specializes in snake intervention and education and is also the owner of K2C Encounters, LLC. <clears throat> Today's going to uh, lead a discussion focused on how to accurately identify local snake species of Virginia. He will also review some best practices on how you can limit snakes from coming onto your property and or into your house. We will take questions from the chat at the end, so please, if you have questions as he um, presents his information, put it in the chat and I'll read the questions at the end of his presentation. All right, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, again, thanks for the invite um, to come out and, and, and chat. This is uh, only a couple of Zooms that I've done, so bear with me with the video. Um, but, uh, Thank you again for the time to come out and chat about, you know, one of my favorite topics is our local snake species here in, in the local areas. Um, I'm going to, I've got a quite a bit of information to go through on this deck and then, uh, but I'm going to try to get through it as quick as I can so that we have more time for questions um, at the end. And then um, again, if you guys have any questions, you can ping in the window and we can address those at the end. So just a really quick intro on myself. Um, let me get my PowerPoint. There we go. So just a quick intro. My name is Bill Crisp. Um, I'm a local uh, Northern Virginian individual um, known as the snake guy, I guess. people That's what people call me on social media a lot of times. Um, local herpetologist. Uh, I live in Bristow, uh, which is between Manassas and Gainesville and near Haymarket, et cetera. Um, I'm also a licensed wildlife control operator for the state of Virginia, which basically means licensed to address nuisance wildlife uh, in the area or for the state. Um, I specialize in just reptiles of Virginia, not just snakes, but that's my main focus. Um, but I do uh, also work with turtles, specifically box turtles, snapping turtles, et cetera. Um, but mainly snakes is my focus. I've been working with uh, non-native and native snakes for over 20 years, um, including venomous. So I've had, um, experience with venomous snakes uh, out west and on the east coast including eastern western diamondback squirrel snakes and then of course our uh, three venomous snakes we have here in the state of virginia our copperheads our cottonmouths and our timber rattlers uh, focus is again as mentioned before education intervention and the sustainability of our our snake species our reptile species in the state and that's something that we do with education. That's where it all starts. Um, being able to provide intervention as much as we can and then to be able to sustain our species, um, education comes into play because we've got to get folks in the communities on board and understanding these, these creatures before we can actually sustain our local population. And hopefully with this discussion today, this will uh, help with that as well. This is my cell phone number here at the bottom. I am available um, really 24 hours a day uh, to provide snake ID or relocation services. Uh, so you can text me a picture of a snake you see hiking or in your backyard, et cetera, if you need an ID on it. Um, I'm usually pretty good about getting back pretty quickly and I can text and we can confirm that um, species for you. The objective today is, um, is to really, whoops, sorry. Trying to get rid of this screen. The objective today is really to 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 get you guys to uh, be a little bit more familiar with how to accurately identify snake species in the area. Um, this is one of the things that is on social media that uh, there is so much misled information um, on snakes in general, specifically copperheads, because anything that's brown and it has a pattern, it's got to be a copperhead. Um, but it's not the case, and we want to make sure that we're providing uh, information for you that can help you hopefully identify that snake. And again, if not, you know, texting me a picture, uh, we can definitely work that out and make sure you have um, the right ID. 
providing helpful and supportive information around our Virginia snakes in hopes that after this call, um, you'll be a little bit more comfortable with snakes and being able to identify them. Um, so that's that's kind of the objective of these two. So. Just to, I'm going to give before we get into the snakes and IDing and things like that. I just wanted to, to share some information about our company. Um, this is a company of friends that basically have have the same backgrounds. Uh, the four individuals you see pictured here are part of K2C. Um, we have actually two other individuals that just recently joined us. Um, so we need a new updated team picture, which hopefully we're going to be doing in December when we meet. Um, but K2C Wildlife Encounters was something that was created. Um, I guess at the beginning of COVID, it's been about two years, I guess. Um, and individuals, Bonnie there in the burgundy shirt and Mark in the gray shirt and myself have known each other for years. Bonnie and I go back way, way back. And we decided, um, you know, maybe we should just create um, a team to help our communities, help educate and spread awareness on the things that we love the most. And since then we started this company uh, together um, and then added individuals. Kelly here in the blue shirt is a uh, retired biologist, and she studied, uh, she did a lot of studies on, on species of frogs and other areas. And then we have other uh, two others that are joining us as well. Uh, we're all certified uh, wildlife uh, control operators for Virginia, and then we cover as much of the Northern Virginia area as we possibly can. Um, but again, even with this as a, as a business, our passion for these animals comes first. So us being wildlife lovers first before the operator piece is always uh, first. We do not, we have, we didn't create this business to make money. Um, this is to essentially provide education. We do charge some for our services, of course, for time and gas. We do provide educational um, programs. Um, We'll do interior, exterior inspections of people's properties. Uh, we'll help with crawl spaces, garages, attics, et cetera. We'll do a little bit of trapping, but that's only to get snakes out of your house. You can find us on online at www.k2cwildlife.com, Facebook, and Nextdoor. Uh, so you can go out and check out uh, those as well. Here are some of the partnering organizations that we uh, work with on a pretty regular basis. Um, NACOA and DWR, obviously DWR is what we're certified through the state of Virginia, um, but we are also um, involved in some of these other organizations. The Virginia Herp Society, that is a, uh, an organization that some of you have probably already heard of or have been uh, maybe members or still are members of, um, that I've been a member for a, a very long time. Um, two of the other individuals uh, here, if you see Tanya's Turtle Project and uh, in the Aero, the Animal Education Rescue Organization, is two uh, individuals I work with closely. And in fact, we're joining forces here in 2023 to, to provide education around just wildlife in general, rehabbing, and some of the construction uh, development projects that were go out and remove wildlife from these areas before they're uh, completely demolished. Uh, we'll be joining forces in 23 to come up with uh, presentations for HOA communities and things like that to help awareness as well. But again, we've done some training with uh, Prince William Animal Control or and the Forest Rangers for Prince William County, uh, doing training on removing venomous snakes, working with copperheads, uh, cottonmouths, and timber rattlesnakes in case they were to come across things like that during their work. This is a, just, again, a, a slide that I created and put out here for VHS. This is a very good resource page um, website. If you have any questions or need an ID of any amphibian, uh, reptile, turtle, et cetera, in the state of Virginia, this site here provides that information for you as well. We are doing a massive overhaul of this site, um, of the information that's out there, but this is a really good organization, especially if you have younger kids that are interested in getting into herpetology. Uh, they do surveying, they do meeting, uh, you know, annual meetings and things like that. And a lot of events where we'll go out and set up a table and present and things like that for VHS. So I do that as part of uh, helping out VHS. Um, so really kind of doing two hats with VHS uh, occasionally and then with K2C. So this is a good website here to have. All right, let's talk about some snake intervention. Um, this is one thing that the team and I are really focused on uh, doing a lot more this year and into the next season. 
uh, because we're running into a lot more of these types of things that are happening uh, within uh, folks' homes and properties, okay? So the first thing here is talking about why glue traps are not a good idea, okay, to use. Now, glue traps are really supposed to be used indoors. Uh, that's really what they're made for. Um, and on occasion, we do use them to trap a snake that we can't find in someone's home. However, using glue traps carelessly can also lead to impacts to our wildlife, especially snakes. And especially if you have these located in your garage or outside, especially during the hot summer months. Snakes get caught on these. They can dehydrate within 30 minutes. Not all of them live, uh, unfortunately. And it's just cruel and un inappropriate suffering for these individuals. Not just for snakes, birds, other animals that can get trapped on these things that can't get off um, is something that we really are trying to educate people not to do. Okay, and if you do do it, if you need to use these, check the traps more often. And there's a simple way of getting them off with just some vegetable oil. It takes two minutes to get these snakes off with vegetable oil or PAM spray. That's something that I do demos for and we'll do uh, hopefully uh, in, in person sessions to show people how to do that if they're comfortable. In this first uh, picture to the left, the northern ringneck snakes, there was five of them on this trap. Uh, this was actually in a lady's basement that we pulled out. Uh, good news is all of them were released and back into the wild, they all lived, even though the one was upside down. Um, there, they are all uh, were released and safe. The Northern Black Racer Juvenile, obviously, this one was uh, bad because he actually had his jaw stuck to the bottom of that sticky trap. And of course, when snakes get on these, they want to wiggle and try to get off, and it just makes it worse. Um, so it is a lot of suffering. This one was actually found in a garage, as you can tell, with all the arachnids stuck to it as well. But this snake was also released and was fine at the time. Unfortunately, the Eastern Rat Snake Juvenile that's in the right-hand picture did not make it. This snake, I'm not sure how long the snake had been on this trap, but the customer had called and we went out and took a look. But this, I would say the snake had been on that for at least probably about you know three to four weeks. Uh, but unfortunately, that one didn't make it. Most of the time we're able to save them, um, but a lot of times we can't. And we wanna make sure that folks are realized when you do use sticky traps, there's a responsibility behind using these and making sure you're checking these traps, okay? Garden netting is another thing. Um, this is another one that we try to steer folks away from using, trying to maybe get folks to use more of a sturdier netting or something that is not as um, loose and able for snakes to get tangled into. Now, birds do the same thing, squirrels, rabbits, they've all been known to get caught in garden netting. Snakes specifically, because snakes um, are very curious animals. They continue to move along looking for food or places to go. And as soon as they get inside this garden netting, they just continue to weed their way through because they assume there's a way out and they're gonna keep doing that. And in fact, it just continues to get worse and then entangled. As you can see here in the left-hand side picture is an Eastern Copperhead in Centerville that was tied up in some garden netting. Thankfully, we were able to get that. Uh, loose and set free. Um, when we work with venomous snakes, um, especially with around netting, <clears throat> we always work in pairs of two. We have someone always securing the snake and then one person working on getting the netting cut free. We never do any of this stuff by ourselves. It's not safe practice. Um, for the Eastern rat snake in the middle, <clears throat> this one was also uh, freed, but as you can see in the middle of the picture, that netting had already started tearing into the snake. Right. And it can do scale damage. It can also, with them twisting and turning, it can do vertebrae damage as well. So we have to be very careful. The good news is this was released and the customer that actually called uh, helped me release this one. So that was fun. And then the one on the right hand side, unfortunately, the Eastern uh, rat snake did not live. This was actually a roll of garden netting that was laid or left on the deck. And as the snake was traveling through, got, got hung up in it and sat there and baked in the sun for most of the day. Uh, so that one did not make it. So again, garden netting, again, checking it and trying to limit people, if you're gonna use it, um, to check those that netting as much as you can, okay? These are getting into some of my favorites. Folks using things to keep snakes away from your house. We're gonna get into this in just a minute, but just so you know, there's nothing that keeps snakes away from your property 100%. Okay, 
There's no data out there that supports it. There's no uh, products on the market right now. No matter how much the Home Depot and Lowe's guy tells you, mothballs do not work for snakes. And in fact, in Prince William County, they're illegal to use outside. Uh, not only are they toxic to the environment, kids, other animals, they were to ingest things like that, um, could become very sick and even in pass. As you can see in this picture here, a copperhead wrapped around or next to a mothball. Mothballs, do, they don't, it doesn't work that way. Their sensory doesn't work the way it does for us or other animals. So they really just don't care. So mothballs do not work. So not only are they dangerous to the environment, they do not work on snakes. Okay. Snake repellent, snake stopper, whatever other product you feel is out there, again, in my, in my opinion, is a waste of time. There are no data points out there today that supports that this stuff works. Um, and in fact, the picture to the right-hand side, you can see the Eastern Copperhead laying right next to the sprinkled pellets. Again, doesn't bother them like it does other animals. Now, I have told people, because this stuff is actually okay to put on your property, um, if you're, you know, you follow the directions, making sure you're doing it correctly. But if you wanna spend the $80 or the $100 or whatever it is on Snake Stopper, because it's gonna make you sleep better at nighttime, you're more than welcome to do it, have at it. It's your money, you can do what you want with it. But again, just knowing that the product does not work. Even though there are folks out there that swear by it, but there is no data that supports that this product actually keeps snakes away from the property. Okay. But there are things you can do to help limit snakes from coming onto your property. Okay. Um, one of the things uh, here, I'm going to go down this bullet list really quickly because I think these are good bullet points for you guys to take notes of. Mowing your grass often and keeping it short. Okay. Keeping snakes out of your tall grass. Snakes like tall grass because they can hide in it. They can travel through it easily. It provides camouflage and cover from the sky because birds, raptors specifically love these snakes. Um, it provides air cover for them, right? So keep your grass mowed, keep it short, keep things trimmed up. Avoid and limit water in your yard. And the reason is, is because what you're doing is you're providing water for your yard, which is providing um, water, nutrients for bugs and other animals, uh, rodents, uh, especially that can come into your yard. And now you're attracting, you're actually opening up a buffet for snakes. Not all the snake species we have in Virginia eat rodents. We have a lot of snakes that, that rely on insects, worms, and things like that. And as you're keeping your ground moist, you're creating that uh, food supply. So that's keeping uh, things out. So try not, and if you do water, because I know I love, my, I love to keep my grass green as well, limit it as much as you can. Um, but just know if you have snakes, that could be a leading cause. Keeping trees and landscapes, uh, landscaping trimmed up. Make sure you can see around your landscaping, right? Again, a snake's not gonna hang out if there's not a place to hide, or if they don't feel safe or it's not a food source around, okay? So keeping trees trimmed up away from your deck away from your house. Specifically, Eastern rat snakes will use trees to get up onto your deck. They'll use it to get up into the vents of, on your house and your attic. Um, they will climb the side of your house as well. They are very good climbers, but keeping trees and things like that trimmed up and away from your home will help limit that. The last thing you need is, is an Eastern rat snake curled up on top of your propane tank underneath your grill, grill and your spouse goes out and tries to turn the gas on and instead gets a handful of snake. Um, I've had that call several times every summer. Um, and again, find out that right beside them is a tree that's connected to, you know, really basically touching the deck. Again, without, just to be clear, you can trim your tree back from the deck. Snake, Eastern rat snakes will climb the deck. Okay, they, they're, like I said, very good climbers. They will find a way up there, especially if there is a food source. Uh, relocate bird feeders and bird houses away from your prop, from away from your house. They attract snakes. Eastern rat snakes, they love baby birds. They love baby bird eggs. It's a very easy meal for them. And every spring we get multiple calls for rat snakes inside of your bird houses, okay? So if you're gonna have them, keep them away from your home unless you're okay with snakes being around. Bullet five is one that um, not a lot of people think of, but I actually had a customer try this and she, she swears it works, is installing perch poles on your, for predators to use like raptors. 
right? A lot of times if you have hawks, red shoulder hawks, uh, Cooper's hawks, et cetera, if they're hanging out around your property, you're probably not gonna have any snakes. Um, they will eat them, um, but providing perching poles so they can come out. I had a lady that um, had told me she had put up perching poles in her backyard. She has a red tail hawk that hangs out around her property. She used to have snakes pre-COVID. She hasn't had a snake on her property since COVID, since she put up those perching poles. Does it work 100%? I'm not sure, but for her, it gave her a sense of relief and something that she enjoys watching her raptors anyway. So um, that's something that can be used. Feeding your pets inside, folks that feed their uh, dogs outside, feral cats, et cetera, that food that you're feeding is now attracting other animals, rodents, rats, bugs, et cetera, which attract the snakes, okay? Uh, relocate wood, brush piles, compost piles away from your home. I have a wood pile in my backyard because I love my fire pits, but um, I don't mind having snakes on my property. However, for those, make sure your wood piles, brush piles, and compost are away from your house. If you have the room to do so, you have the property, push it as far away from your house as you possibly can. Compost piles are notorious. They, eastern rat snakes, racers, they love to lay their eggs and stuff like that because it's humid, it's moist, it keeps the eggs soft. So they will use compost piles for that. Wood piles, copperheads, love wood piles. Think before you landscape, adding in koi ponds, water features, things like that, that can really help keep snakes. I have folks that call me all the time about garter snakes in their backyard. First thing I ask, do you have a koi pond or any type of water source in your back? Yeah, I got koi pond, I got minnows, et cetera. That's why the garter snakes are there. They love frogs, they love toads, they love minnows, they love hanging out. You would basically provide in an oasis for that garter snake doing that. Again, you can still do it, just know you may have snakes on your property. This is a big one, this is what we get a lot, is uh, sealing up cracks and foundations under sidewalks, especially and under porches. Um, that not, not only not keeps snakes away from your property, but it keeps other wildlife away from your property too. Now snakes don't build their own nests, they don't dig holes, they use everybody else's. So they will use those holes underneath your sidewalk and underneath your porch for cover or to cool off in the summertime, sometimes lay their eggs if it's the right place and the right time. Um, but seal those up, keep things from digging underneath your, your steps and porch, that'll help keep the snakes away. Use a hose, a water hose, if you have one near to get a snake off your property. I've had folks call and say, I've got snake, a black snake on my porch or on my deck, how can I get it off? Take a hose. Snakes don't like to be sprayed with water. Um, that'll deter it from at least getting away from you for now until you can maybe call one of us to come out and take a look and see if it's something we need to relocate. Fencing options is something that isn't really used a lot right now, especially in this area. But for those that want to keep copperheads and timber rattlesnakes off your property, if you live in western Fauquier County or you live up near past west of Bull Run Mountain, et cetera, and you want to keep these snakes off your property, providing um, if you have um, planked fencing, not the privacy fencing, but the regular plank fencing, if you add a three to four foot barrier of screen fencing around that uh, perimeter of fence, copperheads and rattlesnakes don't climb like rat snakes do. So that can keep snakes out of your backyard, at least those two. Um, and those are the really the only two that you would need to want to keep out of your backyard. The rest are very beneficial and helpful to be there. Again, some of the things not to do, mothballs we talked about, sulfur acid, for some reason, I'm not sure why anybody would use that. Um, ceramic eggs to fool the snake um, and thinking it's a, another animal's eggs and to scare them away, I've heard that too, it doesn't work. In fact, if there is a scent on that ceramic egg or golf ball, snakes are notorious for swallowing things like that. We had a couple of this uh, past seasons where we've actually had to take it up to Bull Run Wildlife Center to have surgery to remove the golf ball uh, from the snake because they will do that sometimes. Do not go out and collect king snakes uh, from other areas to put in your yard to protect you from other snakes or other venomous snakes. One, there's no, there's no guarantee the king snakes are even going to stay on your property. And two, we don't want to re we don't want to be moving species of snakes from one area to another. Okay. The best thing to do is to call one of us. We can talk about options and what you what kind of situation you have. Relocating problem snakes again, relocating snakes in Virginia is now is legal. 
but we want to make sure we're not overloading populations of snakes either, okay? And plus, if you're going to put that on somebody else's property or on private property or in public property, you got to ask permission to do so. Um, so make sure you do that because you can get in trouble for doing that. Sticky traps outside, stay away from, we've already talked. And then the final thing, do not go get your shovels and your guns and your weapons to take care of a snake. Simply give me a text. I can get to most of your properties in no time flat, and we can take care of that without having to result in violence. The key thing is education. Visit a natural center or park, right? Uh, attend meetings or clubs like VHS and respect that snake. Snake is here to help you and help our environment, not to, to do damage. <clears throat> I get a question all the time, is rehabbing a thing? Yes, for snakes it is. Um, in fact, we had a case here. This is a, a female Eastern rat snake. Uh, we named her Stomper. And unfortunately, this is one of the worst cases that I've seen uh, from snakes being mistreated or um, trying to be killed, okay? The snake that we found was found in a trash bag next to the customer's trash can where the, uh, the customer had repeatedly stomped this snake multiple times. Put it in a trash bag, um, come to find out, we went and got it. Um, my partner, Bonnie uh, Keller um, and Mark went out and got it. Took it to Blue Ridge Wildlife Center to see if there was any hope for this thing. And as you can see, the before picture at the top right corner, the snake was in really bad shape. Had a torn jugular, the vein, a uh, hole in their trachea, punctured eye, and several lacerations of broken ribs. So to me, most people would say that snake's a goner. But we didn't give up on it. We took it to Bull Run, um, and they took care of it. And um, we released the snake, I think, back uh, late July or mid-July. And as you can see, the picture in the middle of her um, up in a tree that was released um, uh, during July. So this snake does did survive. And so rehabbing is a thing. I have folks that call me to say, I found a snake on the side of the road. It's been hit by a car. It's still moving, et cetera. There potentially could be hope for that. So we need to make sure, like any other wildlife, uh, give us a call so that way we can help assist, um, at least through a phone call or a video chat, um, to get to the right places. Again, um, I know several rehabilitators in the area um, and rehabbers that can take snakes on and other wildlife. So again, if you have any questions around just general wildlife uh, rehabbing, you can let me know. Okay, let's get to the snakes, because I know that's what you guys are here for, right? The snakes are cold-blooded reptiles. Cold-blooded meaning they cannot regulate their body temperature themselves. They rely on the heat, the sun, the warm pavement, the warm sidewalks, the warm decks that they get the bask on, especially if you have a Trex deck. They use that to be able to mainly digest their food. Snakes can't have that warmth to digest. That food becomes rotted and decays in their stomach, and it can kill them. Okay. So they do need to be able to warm up. So a snake, if you put a snake in a room of 40 degrees, that snake's gonna be 40 degrees and stay there and most likely probably not live. If the snake's in a room that's 105, it's never be that warm for a snake. But if it is, that snake's gonna be at 105 degrees and is gonna find a way to try to cool. Snakes are made up of vertebrae, muscles, and scales. There are a lot of folks that don't, that really don't realize that snakes have vertebrae. They are made up of all of our vertebrae, hundreds and thousands, depending on the size of snake, um, muscles, and then are covered with scales. Snakes can eat uh, food items three times the size of the largest part of their body. And you're like, there's no way, Bill, that that snake with that small head can eat that food source. And the cool thing about snakes is they can actually somewhat detach the lower part of their jaw, right? And with the snake skin around their face, they can stretch that. So they can consume a larger prey. Most snakes don't, but they will try, uh, especially if they're hungry. Um, but they can do that. And then once they've consumed that, they'll do a big yawn to reset that bone structure and then move on about their business. But they can consume it, uh, large prey. They're eastern rat snakes. Uh, being the one of the, lo the longest snake in the state of Virginia, it easily could take down a squirrel. Uh, or a rabbit, um, and we've seen that before, uh, so they can consume larger prey. It's not really good for them. It's a lot of stress on the animal, uh, but it does happen. Okay, 
uh, snakes, but also can go long periods of time without eating. Um, depending on the species of snake, um, I've had ball pythons that have gone eight months without eating anything. Um, it's just that's the way snakes are built. They're able, their metabolism allows them to do that. But most snakes eat on a pretty regular basis. In the wild, less than they do in captivity, uh, obviously, because they have to work for it in the wild. Um, but the thing about eating in captivity is they can become obese, just like us. So we have to be very careful about how we're feeding them. So nature kind of takes care of the wild snakes and keeps them on their diets that they need to be on. Snakes do shed their skin. Um, they, they shed their skin to, to repair their body, to repair their scales. Um, they'll create a, a milky substance between the old skin and their new, and it helps them release that skin. And it helps them repairs, cuts, scrapes, parasites, et cetera. Um, and they'll do that periodically throughout the year. Younger snakes shed more often, maybe even twice a month. Uh, older snakes may shed every few months, um, but uh, they do shed their skin to help repair their body or create a new paint job. That's what I'd like to call it. Um, are snakes slimy? No, they're not slimy, but they are cool to the touch. Most snakes are very cool to the touch, and folks are very surprised that when they hold a snake for the first time that that snake is actually cool and not really hot. Again, snakes don't like it super hot. They like it warm enough to be able to regulate their body temperature, but they won't stay out in the sun for long periods of time. That's why during the summertime, you may see snakes basking in the morning or in the evening, but you won't see them a lot, a lot of activity during the day because it would be so hot or actually probably underneath your, your steps or your sidewalk where you didn't seal up the gaps and they're cooling off in those places. Snakes do have teeth and they can bite. So I always tell kids when we're doing education, all is like, you have teeth, you have a mouth, right? You can bite your siblings. So snakes, just like us, have a mouth, they have teeth, they can bite. Um, but most of the time don't, okay? Um, but they're on occasion, depending on the species that you're dealing with. And the most talked about is snakes chasing people. Just doesn't happen, folks. Snakes don't chase people. Snakes have an, an agenda. They're going from point A to point B. If you're in the middle of that, they're going to come at you, okay? But again, I've told people to test this theory, and I've actually done it too. If you have a snake in your backyard and you want to test the theory, get in front of the snake, see what it does. See if it comes towards you. If it, if it continues to come towards you, shift to the right 10 feet or left and see if the snake follows you. The snake, most likely, if it isn't scared of you, some will. It'll continue to come towards the way it was because that was the direction it was going to. It's on a mission. It knows where it's going. They're not out there to get you. Unless maybe you visited South Africa and you came across a black mamba, then that snake's been uh, known to chase people. But unless you have done that, then you're, you're in good shape. All right, let's talk about Virginia's non-venomous snake species. <clears throat> We have 34 species of snake in the state of Virginia, three of which are venomous, okay? We are not gonna talk about all 34 today because we would be here for the next few hours. So I'm gonna break it down to the top nine species of snakes that is seen the most or ones that we get calls about the most, okay? To give you an idea of how to identify them and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. <clears throat> but again, if you want to see the remaining of these snakes, you can go out to the VHS site, take a look at it, because there are species that we're not going to cover, but they are uh, located in this area. Okay, but again, these are the ones we see the most of. Out of the 34 species, we have three that are venomous, not poisonous, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Eastern or Northern Copperhead, which most of you have probably seen before or heard about. The Timber Rattlesnake which um, unless you live in western Fauquier County or west of Bull Run Mountain, probably not going to have see a timber rattlesnake um, as they're very secluded animals anyways, but it does happen. We picked up one in western Fauquier just about less than a month ago. Um, so they are in the area. They're just not in this immediate uh, Bristow, Gainesville, Manassas area. And then the notorious northern cottonmouth or water moccasin where folks Swear they've seen them here, and they just do not have it, inhabit this area, okay? What you're seeing is the northern water snake that looks almost identical to it, and we're going to talk about that in just a second as well. Okay, 
Let's start with the most seen snake. I think everyone on this call has probably seen the snake in some form or fashion. This is our Eastern rat snake, not our black snake, where people will call and say, I have a black snake in my yard. And we're gonna talk about that because there's actually five species of snake in the local area that are black in color. Doesn't mean they are a black snake. I've heard Virginia black snake, the common black snake, um, et cetera. And there is no species of snake in Virginia that is classified as a black snake, okay, in their, in their, as their kind of their species, okay? This is the eastern rat snake. This is the longest snake that we have in Virginia. They can reach lengths up to about 72 inches, um, but we have a larger one. Uh, we have one, uh, Bonnie, who uh, has had this snake for quite some time. It is a 20 plus year old eastern rat snake we use for demo and educations. The snake is around eight feet long, um, over 20 years, and was, um, uh, was unable to be released years ago. Um, and this snake is massive. It is right now, we think, the largest, longest rat snake in the state of Virginia at just, a, I think it's a hair of eight feet. Um, and if you come to one of my demos, you know, in the spring um, and things that I have in the area, I usually bring these snakes with us. So um, that way you can actually have an opportunity to hold them and get up close to something a little bit easier than in the wild. Food sources, rodents, lizards, frogs, bird eggs, like we talked about. They are egg layers. Not all of our snakes species in Virginia are egg layers, but this one is. As you can see from the map, they do populate most of Virginia. And this is one of the things that's most common. Folks see what you see on the right-hand side is a juvenile Eastern rat snake. It has a pattern. They think that these two snakes on this, page, this slide here are two different species of snakes. And in fact, they're the same. It's just that these rat snakes are born with a pattern for camouflage purposes. And after about the first year, that pattern starts to fade, okay? Not all Eastern rat snakes will get rid of that pattern completely, but for the most part, they fade into what you see on the left as a completely black snake with a white underbody. Unfortunately, this snake here uh, doesn't have an eye. If you can tell that little white spot where the eyeball is, that one was uh, didn't have an eyeball. Um, this one I had rescued from a neighbor's uh, yard. But all the pictures you're gonna see, most of them, are either pictures that I've taken in the field or customers have taken for me and sent them to me to ID and I've used those pictures in there. So that's that's kind of cool to be able to use uh, customer pictures. So like I said, this is the, the largest species of snake longest in our, um, in, in the Virginia region. So we're gonna talk about um, the next black snake that we have, which is the Northern Black Racer. And this too, does populate most of Virginia. This one also has a pattern when it's little uh, or when it's a juvenile. And then when it matures, it drops the pattern completely. Now, most racers are going to not have any pattern as adults. There's, I've seen very few, but usually they are a dull black matte color, okay? And we're gonna talk about the differences between those and how to ID them in just a second. This is not the longest snake in Virginia, but it sure is the fastest snake. The racer being in its name is the first defense of what the snake will do. Normally, when motion approaches the snake, it will take off. It doesn't want anything to do with you. However, it will turn and defend itself. It will bite you repeatedly if you try to pick it up. Um, this is one of the species of snake that I least like to deal with, especially when you're irritating it and trying to pull it out of a very tight place. Um, I've been bit, bit by the snake a hundred times uh, in the past, but again, very cool snake, um, but very fast. A lot of times the reason why um, I ask people, um, they call me and say, I have a black snake in my yard. What does it look like? Is it shiny or is it dull? Because if I'm 20 minutes away and it's a racer, chances are I'm not going to be able to get there in time. Okay. It's just not going to hang out, especially if you're around it and poking a stick at it or trying to shine a flashlight on it. If it's at night, et cetera, it's not going to stick around. Again, not the longest, but the fastest. The diet changes with these, these snakes. They'll eat anything. They've even known to consume copperheads. They don't do it on a regular basis, but they can. Um, you talk, folks will talk about keeping rat snakes and things in their yards to keep copperheads out. Rat snakes don't even mess with copperheads. In fact, 
black snake, rat snakes are known to den with copperheads in the winter. So it's not necessarily something that they use as a food source, but they are known to, racers are known to kill and consume sometimes copperheads. Uh, also an egg layer. But here's a, this is how we compare the two. People always ask, well, how do I know the difference between a racer and a rat snake, right? And the differences are here. These are, here's a, some, a couple of things that can help clarify that. Color um, is very different. Uh, the rat snake has more of an iridescence color, right? More of a shiny, glossier color. That's how people think of the glossy paint, black paint versus the matte black paint you would get where a racer has more of that dull matte color, okay? Eyeballs are a huge indicator. Um, as you can see, the racer's eyes take up most of the face, okay? Where you can actually see the pupil of the eye from, a ra uh, from an actual rat snake. The head shape, shorter, rounded snout from a racer. Um, looks a little meaner, I think, you know, um, they almost have that bottom jaw and face feature of like a mamba, like a green or a black mamba. If you've seen those on TV before, they kind of resemble that a little bit. I call it the Virginia mamba because it's very aggressive, can be, and it is so quick and twitzy. Um, head shape, again, more curved pointed versus long snout where the, the, uh, the rat snake has more of a pointed or long snout. The diets are different. Um, again, racers will consume just about anything, but they really do prefer smaller stuff like bird, bird eggs, amphibians, lizards, skinks, things like that, where a rat snake is, is seen more probably consuming a larger prey um, and can take down much larger. Defense-wise, race away is in the name. It's, that's what it does. It's its natural instinct is to get away from you. It wants nothing to do with you at all. However, if it's cornered, it will defend itself. It will strike, it will hiss, et cetera. The Eastern rat snake does the thing. They will hold their ground. A lot of snake, a lot of the Eastern rat snakes will turn, S up and strike at you and hold their ground, but they're also known to just get away from you, okay? They'll even rattle their tail on the ground to make it sound like a rattlesnake because they want you to think. Now, snakes in general don't have a lot of defense mechanisms as it is. So a rattle of the tail with some leaves could convince a predator to leave, that it is dangerous. So this is just something here that uh, gives you a good comparison to, because these are the most two common black snakes we see um, in this area. Everybody's seen an Eastern garter snake, most likely. Uh, these are really cool snakes. Again, these are individuals that are probably hanging out around your koi ponds, or if you have wet areas or water areas around your property. Not a very big snake, up to 18 inches long, but they do come in a variety of shades of color. Um, anything from a dark black checkered uh, pattern to a light olive, uh, almost yellow pattern. Um, but again, that checkered pattern on the back is an indication of a garter snake, okay? Um, so if you see that, uh, no matter how much it flares its head, no matter how much it rattles its tail, if it has that checkered pattern here, it gives you a good indicator that it's most likely a garter snake. There's a picture of one here consuming in the middle of a consuming a toad. I actually took a picture of this in my front yard or my front landscaping. And then the other two are just uh, the darker colors that you may see. But again, that, that key thing is that stripe down the back and that checkered pattern on the sides. Okay. Oh, and, and with these guys, with Eastern garters, they have live young. When they have babies, they have a lot of them and they have them live. Um, usually in dens with multiple other garter snakes, um, but they do have several of them. Their diets do change, frogs, toads, minnows, leeches, salamanders, et cetera. And as the snakes we start talking about start getting smaller, their lifespan starts to shrink, and you can only wonder why, right? Foxes, uh, raptors, et cetera, like to eat snakes as part of their diet. This is just a, uh, a black snake slide. Local snakes, black in color, because again, there is no black snake in Virginia, the species wise. But as far as the coloring, there are, there are several or five that really uh, have that black tone or people think have a black snake. So we talked about the Eastern rat snake, we talked about the Northern racer, and just talked about the Eastern garter. The two we haven't talked about are ones you're not gonna see very often, but they are here in this area. The Eastern Hognose, which is one of my favorite snakes. We have some time at the end, I'll tell you why. Just remember to ask me why that's my favorite snake and I'll tell you. And then the Eastern King Snake, which most of you probably know why it's called a King Snake. 
because it will consume and does a lot of times other snakes, including copperheads and rattlesnakes. Okay, so it's the king of all snakes. It's immune to their venom, um, so they can consume those most of the time. But they will eat other things like rodents and, and lizards and things like that. So again, gives you an idea of when customers are calling about a black snake on my property. It gives you an idea of what we kind of think, what our thinking process is as we go through this. We'll wonder what kind of black snake it is. Okay. Continuing on with the top nine, the Northern Mole King. This is one of my favorite snakes of Virginia, um, especially as a juvenile. Again, this snake has a pattern as a juvenile. As it matures, that pattern fades, but it doesn't always, it doesn't go away completely. You can still see here that it's an adult. This snake does keep its pattern, but it does eat other snakes as well. It is an egg layer as well. This one's more, when this one's a juvenile, uh, this picture doesn't really show it, but this the burgundy color uh, on their back is is one of the prettiest colors on a snake that we have in this in the, in the state. Um, it's very bright burgundy and very cool, um, which is one of one of the reasons why I like this snake. The case brown snake. This is again um, a smaller species of snake. This snake here, however, because of that pattern on its back, the spotted pattern, this snake is always confused with a copperhead. Why? Because it's a brown copper color and it has a pattern on it, so it's got to be a copperhead. And in fact, it's not. So with this snake here having the spots down the spine, we're going to show you uh, here in a later slide a copperhead and what that looks like is a very distinctive pattern. You're never going to be able to confuse it in the state of Virginia, the difference between a decays brown and an eastern copperhead. Okay, this is a very small snake, live young. They do, they are good for your gardens. They're good for your property. They eat all the things you don't want. Um, insects, worms, nightcrawlers, slugs, the whole nine. They love eating this stuff. And very cool. So if you have kids or you have grandkids, pick them up, enjoy them. They're a lot of fun. They rarely bite at all. Here's a couple other pictures of some darker color um, ones as well. Then we're moving on to our eastern worm snake. Again, one of the prettiest snakes, especially this one here on the left-hand side. This snake was, this is not edited. This snake was gray, silver on top, and pink on the bottom. Uh, it was one of the, the coolest looking uh, worm snakes that I've seen uh, in the field. Again, very small. These snakes are actually uh, somewhat um, mistaken for night crawlers. Uh, when people are gardening and things like that, they are tiny snakes and they do look like, so you may have stepped on them, you may have stepped by them thinking it was a worm and it was actually a snake. We do have these very small species of snake here. Again, two to four year lifespan, you can only imagine why. <laughs> they make a good meal for these uh, other predators here. Live young, of course, all the smaller snakes, uh, smaller in size are the live young bears. So. Here's another one, the northern water snake. This one is the one that is always confused and probably most likely seen as uh, in a water area that folks think is a cottonmouth. Okay. And the reason is because it does look like one. It's got a very fat body. The head's very thick, does have a pattern on it, and it's in the round of water. So it's got to be a cottonmouth. And in fact, cottonmouths do not inhabit this area. Okay. And if you do find one or your friend finds one, Send me a picture because I really do want to know. It's not to prove anyone wrong that they don't inhabit this area, but over the last 20 years, research, surveying, not one has been found in this area. Okay. What people are finding are these water snakes that look and can be aggressive like a um, cottonmouth. They're a fat bodied snake, very heavy bodied, uh, 42 inches, still a good sized snake. Um, but they, they heavily rely on fish and amphibians for food. Um, so I've, I've seen folks make comments on social media about water snake on your property keeps the rodents away. They don't, really, they don't eat that. They could, but they rely on fish. Catfish, crappie, bluegill uh, easily can take that down. Okay. Again, here's some other pictures of ones here, and we're going to talk about that compared to the cotton. I'm going to try to speed this up a little bit so we can get through some questions. Northern ring snakes, we talked, we showed these at the beginning on the sticky traps. Again, very cool snakes. 
Uh, another one I would pick up and enjoy. Um, again, rarely bites, but this is one of the cool. Obviously, you can tell why it's a ring neck snake. The ring around the neck, okay? That snake keeps that all its life. From when it's born till it dies, it keeps that ring. And in some parts of Virginia, southern parts of Virginia, that is actually orange or yellow color. Um, so that's an easy way to, end, uh, to identify uh, northern ring neck. Again, another. But this one being a small snake, as you can see, is an egg layer. So not all small snakes are live bearers. Eastern smooth earth snake, again, another very small snake, brown in color, silver in color. Um, but again, something you may have mistaken as a worm because they're very tiny. That's the top nine non-venomous that are most likely seen in the area or most likely ones I deal with in the most. But there are corn snakes in this area. There are king snakes in this area. There are hog nose in this area. There are milk snakes in this area, okay? But you just don't see them a lot because a lot of them are very secluded unless you're looking for them. Um, a lot of times, I've lived in uh, Prince William County, Northern Virginia all my life. I have found three corn snakes in the wild since I've been here. So a lot of times they're just not seen. Okay, now we're getting into the non-venomous, which I know is, is interest to some of you, okay? I put, I put this slide out here because um, I know it's not October, but we just did go through and, and, and uh, identify breast, care, breast Cancer Awareness Month in October. But I like to put this out here because copperheads are one of the most hated snakes in general. Snakes in general are hated because people are afraid of them. But copperheads especially because they're venomous. But if you can get past that fear and understand what these snakes can do for us, what they do for the environment. They have the ability to seek out a sick mouse versus a healthy mouse and take out the sick population first versus the healthy population, okay? Their venom is currently being used today to help fight cancer, reduce tumors. It is also being worked towards Alzheimer's right now as well. So there is benefit to having these snakes. And I understand it's a difference but having a, one on your property, right? which is where we can come in and take care of it for you, right? Everything we catch, we relocate. <clears throat> um, we only euthanize things that we need to that may be in distress or not gonna make it or suffering. But again, these guys here serve more than the purpose of taking care of our rodent population. They also help serve to help us as well. So I like to put that out there. Identifying a venomous snake by the head shape. Not a good idea. It's not a reliable source. And the reason why is if you take and put your hand over those three pictures of that rattler, rat snake, and copperhead, and just looked at the shaded pictures, would you be able to tell the difference between a rat snake and a copperhead? Not in those pictures. Why? Because non-venomous snakes have the ability to flare their head. They do that as one of their very few defense mechanisms to make them look like they're venomous. Okay, they'll do anything they can to help themselves not being killed or eaten. Okay, so rat snakes, as you can see here, this juvenile is flaring its head compared to where it's not being flared. They can do it. I hear this on social media so much is if it has a triangular head and a slit pupil, it is definitely venomous. And that's not the case at all. Okay, non venomous snakes can flare their head to make it look like they are venomous. Okay. And I always tell people too, if you're so close that you can see the slit in that eye of that snake, you are way too close and probably will end up getting bitten, okay? But again, we'll talk about that in just a second. The slit isn't always the case. So again, not a reliable way of IDing a venomous versus non-venomous. Venomous versus poisonous, this is always uh, something that comes up too. Um, venom simply is injected into your bloodstream, a bee, a, a scorpion, an ant, right? They all inject venom to cause injury, okay? Poison is something you ingest, swallow, or inhale. If you eat one of our species of frogs, probably gonna get sick. Wouldn't suggest anybody to do that. Uh, folks say, well, what about eating snakes? Probably wouldn't do that either, right? Um, but again, that's the differences. You always hear people say, poisonous snake, got a poisonous snake, poisonous snake, again, it's all about the education and awareness. There are no poisonous snakes. There are venomous, and the venom reason is because they inject that venom directly, okay? We're gonna talk about what we should do if we ever get bit by a venomous snake here in just a second as I breeze through a couple more of these slides. All right, Eastern Copperhead. 
This is the most seen snake in this area, in Virginia in general. Um, we just, re this summer, I think we surpassed our record of the most uh, relocations or, um, you know, copperheads that we removed from people's property of about almost close to 80 this year, this season. Um, they are thick uh, in parts of Woodbridge and Manassas, et cetera, but they are all over the place, okay? Copperheads have a very distinctive pattern. And what I like to use to identify the pattern because I love chocolate is Hershey Kisses. So if you look at the pattern of a snake, of a copperhead, you'll see that it does resemble Hershey Kisses. Now, some people will say that looks like a Hershey Kiss, looks like a flame, looks like a volcano, whatever the case is, whatever makes you feel good that you can identify it, but no other snake has this pattern. Okay, I'm gonna show you a mimic of what a pattern close to this looks like on a northern water snake. But for this here, that Hershey kiss is a telltale sign. That's a copperhead, okay? Now, baby copperheads have this yellow or lime green tail when they're born. They keep that for the for first uh, half of the first year, maybe, roughly. And then eventually that, that goes away. But if you see a snake in the state of Virginia, depending on where you are, baby snake that has a yellow or lime green tail, there's only two snakes that could have it. One, a cotton, a, a cotton mouth baby also has them, and a copperhead, okay? Again, copperheads are very tiny when they're born. As you can see in this picture to the bottom left, that's a quarter. Those are very tiny snakes. They come out live in an embryo sac ready to go, and they are as venomous as the adults. And we're going to talk about are venomous, are the adults more deadly than the babies? Because I know that's very controversial, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But again, as you can see, they have the slit pupil. They have a nostril. But what they also have that non-venomous don't have is a heat-seeking pit where they can actually pick up thermal heat from prey or animals um, as, as they hunt. That slit pupil is used for night hunting, okay? But being able to tell the difference between a non-venomous snake and a venomous snake from that slit, it's not. The copperheads can actually dilate their pupils to be round as well. Um, I don't have a picture of it here, but I do have pictures of ones that I have removed and kept overnight. And in the mornings, turning on the lights, they will flex that pupil and it is round. So again, not a good idea to, to use that uh, slit as your indicator. 15 to 18 years, average length, 24 to 36 inches. That's still a big snake. We had one that we removed from a property uh, this summer was 37 or 39 inches, which is a very big uh, copperhead. Uh, 48 is the Virginia record. Um, the venom is a mild hemotoxin. Copperhead venom is probably one of the most mild venoms on the planet, okay? Can still do damage, but it affects mainly the tissues or your, your the nerve cells, right? Or the, the, the blood cells. A lot of times um, has effect on temporary damage to maybe your finger or your toe or your foot, wherever you're bit, because that's usually where people are bit the most by copperheads. Um, but again, we'll talk about that more in just a second. Baby copperhead season, you just missed it. It was mid-August to early October. That's where they most of their young are, are had at that time. Okay, so just so you know, next season, keep your eyes and ears open uh, for those in the spring or in the fall time. Some quick FAQs on copperheads. Are baby copperheads more dangerous than adults? This is not a yes or no question, folks. Okay, so I can't say yes or no. But what I can tell you based on, on my experience, Let's let's take this, uh, we'll, we'll break it into two silos. One, from a venom perspective, okay? A baby copperhead is very tiny. We just talked about that. An adult copperhead is a much larger snake. So compare a venom gland the size of a pea for a baby and a venom gland the size of a lima bean for an adult. If both of those snakes were to bite you, what do you think is going to distribute more venom, the lima bean or the pea? Obviously, the lima bean because it's a bigger venom gland. So from a venom perspective, adults are more dangerous than babies. Yes, can they control their venom yield, et cetera? I hear that all the time. Yes, they can. But again, babies may give you a little bit more, but what they give you is a fraction of what the adult's going to give you if they give you everything. Now, most copperheads, when they bite adults, will give out maybe 40% of their venom. They're not going to give you everything. And can they tell how much to give you? Sure can. They can do it based on size, 
they know that I'm a human and they're not probably going to consume me. So most likely not going to give me a lot because they're not going to waste that venom. They rely on that venom to hunt and kill prey so they can eat. Okay. There is some, but however, baby copperheads can be dangerous too, even so more than the adults. And my opinion is if you're out gardening or cleaning up around your house, you can't see these little snakes and you happen to stick your hand down behind a bush and you get tagged by one of these smaller snakes. In that sense, I think baby copperheads are more dangerous than the adults, but not from a venom perspective. There is some science uh, discussion out there that baby copperhead venom, the proteins in the venom are a little bit different as babies because it helps work. The proteins work faster to kill the prey so the prey can't get up too far away from the baby. That might be the case, but it's still the same venom. Okay. Regardless, if you get bit by a baby or an adult, you need to get medical attention ASAP. Okay, we talked about the, the different types of venom uh, or the venom types. They do have the same as cottonmouths and rattlers, but the problem is with the other two snakes, you're getting a heck of a lot more venom from the other two. Okay, they're much bigger venom glands, uh, much bigger effects. Okay, do baby copperheads have different venom? We talked about that. Could be a little bit when they're little, the protein wise, but not different venom itself. If bitten by a copperhead, should I seek medical attention? Yes. Doesn't matter if you think you've been envenomated or not, and you'll be able to tell within five or 10 minutes, most likely, but still go get checked out, okay? Can baby copperheads control the amount of venom? Yes, they can, and so can adults, all right? Um, can they do it every time? Maybe not, right? But they can. Can copperheads also be uh, distribute venom if they, after they've been killed? If you cut a head off of a copperhead and pick it up and that fang comes in contact with your skin, yes, you can be in venom. Okay. Do copperheads breed with other non-venomous snakes? My grandma told me for years that Eastern rat snakes and copperheads were breeding on her property and there was some type of hybrid. This was 30 years ago. Now, if she was still around, I would say, grandma, that's not the case. They don't do that. Okay, there is no hybrid copperhead eastern rat snake. Okay, they do den with one another in the winter. They're known to do that, but they don't interbreed. Do copperheads distribute venom every time they bite? No, they're defensive bites and there's prey seeking bites. Defensive bites could be just a bite to say, hey, you just stepped on me or watch you're getting too close. And in some cases, you're not envenomated at all. But still, you need to go check it out, get checked out. Okay. If you do get bit by a copperhead, your wallet's going to feel it, that's for sure, or your insurance is going to feel it because it is very expensive. Now, this quote here is back in 2015. Uh, there was a lady in Montgomery County three or four years ago that was bit by a copperhead out in her backyard. She went by, out to her pool. She picked up the copperhead baby. It bit her in the hand. She had the multiple vials of antivenom. She walked out of a, with a bill of about $170,000, and her insurance, unfortunately, only covered 10% of it. So again, vials are very expensive, anywhere from ten dollars to $12,000 a vial, depending on how much you need, depending on how much venom you were given and what type of snake can be very expensive, okay? Is the venom gonna kill you? No, not necessarily, right? Is it more, uh, more cautious when around kids and elderly? Yes, because uh, there could be a condition. You may have a medical condition you don't know about, when people have died from snake bites, it's mainly not from the bite itself, but it's from a condition they've had, a reaction, allergic reaction from the antivenom and things like that. But very few have died from an actual snake bite itself. Dogs are notorious for getting bit in the face. Most of them survive. We've had several of that this year with customers that have been bit, uh, dogs have been bit in the face. They do survive, most of them, but it can be sometimes fatal. Copperhead bites control, they have extreme pain, tingling, throbbing, swelling. You feel sick for a few days, et cetera. Can put you out for a couple of weeks, maybe longer, depending on how significant the bite is. But again, just making sure if you are bit or your animals are bit, make sure you get it to the vet or get yourself to the doctor. Here's some mimics just really quickly, copperheads. As you can see, the black uh, Eastern Northern racer at the top left and the copperhead compared, again, folks, we're talking about color identification here, knowing the patterns and the color. Copperheads are brown, copper, and color. Racers and Eastern rat snakes, as you can see, are darker black, white, and silver in color. 
So there is a distinguished, and there's that Hershey Kiss or hourglass. People say sometimes it looks like an hour. Okay. Eastern milk snake we didn't talk about today, but we do have them. Loudoun County's full of them. Um, Sky Meadows Park is full of them. Eastern milk snake compared, yeah, it's pretty close, right? I mean, that looks pretty close to a copperhead. If you were to come up on it on a trail, you may think twice and need to think about that. This guy here to the right, the Northern Juvenile Water Snake, right? The one we talked about earlier. This is as they're a little bit younger. This has a pattern, but I, I, I take this, I show this pattern all the time because the other one with copperheads, right? We're looking at a Hershey Kiss pattern. This one looks like alien heads or looks like smokestacks, right? Like a smoke from, a, um, from an engine or something, right? Not the Hershey Kiss. So you can tell the difference between the two patterns. Again, that Hershey Kiss pattern is very distinctive. And sometimes in the middle of that pattern, you have a dot. Corn snakes, we do have. Hog nose, we do have. But again, corn snake, um, that corn snake there in the middle of the page, pretty close, right? Brown, orange in color. Yeah, you could mistake it as a copyright. But again, it's lacking that Hershey Kiss. Okay, northern water snake uh, compared to a northern cottonmouth. Also, second venomous snake in this in, in Virginia, but not in this area. These guys inhabit the area about 30, 40 miles south of Richmond. So unless you're down there canoeing or hanging out near the Outer Banks, et cetera, you will not see this snake in this area, okay? Again, lime green tail, they call them cotton mouse because of the inside of their mouth. When you do come up on this snake, it will hold its ground. It will flare its mouth open to show you that cotton color. Okay, don't want to get bit by this snake. The snake will pack a punch. Okay, a lot when you're talking probably twice the amount of venom you'd get from a copper if it was to give you everything. Again, slit pupil, we know what to do with that. Heat seeking pit and nostril. Folks ask me, well, then how do you tell the difference safely from a cottonmouth and a northern water snake? There's an easy way to do it from a, a distance. So that way you don't have to worry about getting too close to the snake. As you can see in this picture here, cottonmouth is floating on top of the water. They will fill their body up with air so they can actually float and swim across the water. And in fact, cottonmouths are also known to just sit and flow with the current, okay? Water snakes will swim submerged majority of the time. They'll come up for air, but they are completely underwater when they swim. Cottonmouths are floating the entire time with that head that looks like a cobra. But as you can see, that pattern compared to what we saw in the previous slide, pretty close, right? It, it looks almost identical. Um, the head's a big fat head. You can see that real puffy um, venom gland off the side of the face. That's full of nice venom for you. But again, not located in this area, okay? Here's a mimic real quick. These aren't very good pictures, but you can see at the bottom right-hand corner, that's a northern water snake. Again, heavy bodied compared to this one, could get it confused, right? You could think that that's what you're looking at because they look pretty close. Here's some south. Uh, you have the venomous cottonmouth compared to uh, the brown water snake that's also south of Richmond. Okay, that water snake is not up here. But again, if you put these, these guys close, you could mistake it very, very easily. But look at the difference in that head. The venom gland is massive. Okay. Okay. The last and final venomous snake, our timber rattlesnake, my favorite snake in the state of Virginia. The snake is a very secluded snake. You're not going to see these very often. Okay. That's why they live to be so big and so old because they're not out just hanging out. Occasionally we'll get calls, uh, like I said recently, in, in western Fauquier County, Bull Run Mountain, west of Bull Run Mountain, and up through LaRay, Shenandoah. If you hike in the Shenandoah, you, chances of seeing one of these is pretty good. Um, over the last three years, um, they've been really thick with them up there. I've had friends that are avid hikers that text me pictures all the time uh, of them seeing rattlesnakes. These rattlesnakes come in this olive type uh, pattern color. Some of them are more black or dark brown as well. So they do come in a variety of colors. But again, big fat head with those venom glands. Uh, this one you're gonna get, you're gonna have some trouble if you get bit. So you gotta be very careful if you're hiking um, stay away from these snakes. Enjoy them from a distance. They will tell you that they're there most of the time. With that rattle on the back of their tail, they use that as a device to, to basically warn you off. 
okay? Do they do it all the time? No, they don't. Uh, but most of the time they will rattle that tail. Those rattles are made up of segments of every time they shed their skin, they create a segment on that tail. And people always ask, well, can you tell the age difference of a rattlesnake based on its tail? And the answer is no, because those rattles do break off. So you can have a full mature rattlesnake with just the nub. Rattlesnakes can rattle their tail three times the fast as a hummingbird flaps its wings. And there's little segment, bone segments inside that rattle that makes that rattling noise. Okay. So again, this is uh, largest venomous snake, um, but again, one of, one of the very cool venomous snakes that we have. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, bites, okay? So if you were bitten by a venomous snake, let's talk about what not to do. Try not to be overexerted. Don't run back to the car. Don't, don't get, try to keep yourself calm. And I know it's hard. You've been, just, you've been, been bit by a venomous snake. You're freaking out. You don't know what to do. And now your, your heart's pumping. Try to keep the person as calm as possible. Keep yourself calm, depending on who's been bit. And get back to the car and get to help as soon as you can. Okay? Do not apply a tourniquet. Okay? Tourniquets are actually have proven to cause more damage. And the reason is, is because you're tying off a second. Say, for example, you get bit in the hand. If you were to tie a tourniquet off around your elbow, you're now isolating that venom in that forearm area in your hand area, which gives the venom more time to react and do damage to your skin and tissue, okay? It's best just to let the venom go. It's already in your bloodstream, just let it flow. Get to the doctor as soon as you can. Do not apply a cold compress because that can aggravate the bite or the venom, right? The bite around that area, it can cause um, it to have an allergic reaction. It can irritate the bite. No cold, cold compresses. Cut into the bite with a knife. No, do not do that. All you're gonna do is make it worse. The venom is in your bloodstream. There's nothing you can do at this point. So this little um, snake kit on the right-hand side that comes with a, a piece of string to tie your arm off. It comes with a razor blade to cut the wound open. I don't know why they even sell that anymore, but it doesn't work. Don't buy those things, they're not worth the money. Do not try to suck the venom out of the mouth. There's two reasons why you shouldn't do that. One, it doesn't work, only in the movies, right? And two, if you have a cut in your mouth, you've now envenomated yourself twice. So now you're in twice as much trouble. Again, get to the hospital. And finally, don't take any medication. Don't give anybody any medication. Just drink water and get to the hospital, okay? Really quick, some true falses here. Uh, we'll start with uh, all snakes. Uh, all snakes, I can't see the top of my screen for some reason. So I will just start with the all snake species bite. Yes, they can. They have a mouth, they can bite. Virginia snakes are considered poisonous. Nope, we, we clarified that as part of the venom, right? All snakes eat rodents in Virginia. Nope, we have bug eaters, slug eaters, etc. cetera. Uh, snakes often dig their own nests or create their own nests. No. They do not. They use everybody else's. They're lazy. They're going to use everybody else's things. If I find a snake shed on my property, do I have a snake problem? No, you do not. Not necessarily. Snakes will cruise through, especially eastern rats, shed their skin and move on. Um, all Virginia snakes lay eggs. We know that's not true because some have live babies. Snakes um, can live up into over uh, 20 years. Yes. So for parents, grandparents, if you're thinking about a snake for your grandchildren or your kids, when they go off to college, guess who's going to be taking care of that snake? You will be. Okay, so just keep that in mind. If bitten by a venomous snake, apply a tourniquet. No, we don't want to do that. And the most controversial piece of social media, I think, is out there. Is it legal to kill a snake in the state of Virginia? The law states it is illegal to kill a snake in the state of Virginia unless that snake is causing harm to you, your livestock, your family, your dogs, et cetera. So there's a, a lot of opinions about this. I'll give you my opinion. If I'm walking out to the barn and I noticed off to the side about 15 feet, a copperhead or a rattlesnake curled up beside the tree, I'm not going that way, but I'm going down to the barn. I walk out of my way to go kill that snake. That is illegal. 
if I go into the barn and I'm in the barn in the stall with my horse and I turn around and I try to exit, but there's a rattlesnake curled up rattling and I can't get out. And the only way to get out of there safely to get my dog out, my horse out and myself out is to kill the snake. Then again, you, you got to do what you got to do. Okay. Yep. And that is the end of oh, the presentation. Great. Thank you. That was fantastic. And we have some questions and I have a question. When, um, so I live in, um, on properties near um, the Occoquan. We all have wooded large properties. We have a lot of copperheads. When do they start denning? Do you think they're denning now with this cold weather? Because that's when we can let our dogs roam a little further. Yeah, as it starts, I mean, snakes in general uh, will find cover when it starts consistently becoming, you know, 40s, et cetera. When it starts consistently being cold, the tricky part with our weather is, is you know, we've been known to hit 60 in February. We've been known to, to warm up. Snakes don't technically hibernate like mammals do. They do a hybrid, which is a, what they call bromation, which is basically a hybrid. They don't technically sleep. They, they shut their body down a little bit. Their metabolism gets a lot slower, but they kind of go into dormant a little bit. But as soon as it warms up, they'll come out. Um, like I said, we've seen snakes in February um, in the past years. But as it starts getting consistently cold, 40s, I would say, give or take, um, and, and freezing at night like it's going to be this week, um, yeah, they're starting to go in. But on those warm days, where it does warm up to you know, 50s or 60s, snakes can still be active. Yes. Um, and also, I, there's a whole army of shovel uh, people in our neighborhood, and I'm trying to encourage them. <laughs> How about, what do you think about the snake tongs? I mean, if they don't text you, can they successfully relocate or remove them on, within their property? using tongs? Yes, good cut. Well, good question. We actually have educated folks, homeowners, on how to use tongs as well. If you're interested in that, we can show you how to safely use those. Yeah. But we have several customers that have gone out and bought their own tongs so they can safely remove a snake from their property. Yeah. And, and the goal is really, right, is to educate people to be able to help us, you know, keep the stability of our snake species. The five, the six of us that work with K2C, we can't do it by ourselves in Northern Virginia. I have enough trouble covering Bristow, Gainesville, and Haymarket. Yeah. But if we can get people comfortable enough using the tongs, at least, mm -hmm. they can get the snake safely out of the way, and that way it doesn't have to be killed. So, yes, it is possible. And happy to provide information or training on that for folks. Um, and then the questions, any suggestions for achieving a happy medium between keeping grass mowed and trees and bushes trimmed and creating a nature-friendly environment, um, in, including leaving the leaves on your lawn. There's a big push yep. to leave the leaves for pollinators now. Yeah, it's, it's, that's a good question. That one's a hard one. Um, I, I would say enjoy your yard. Do what you want with your yard. Have as much stuff in it. I, I mean, I love koi ponds. I love having stuff overgrown sometimes because of privacy, et cetera. I just think it's important that folks... Um, just know and be cautious that, you know, you could have snakes on your property. And some of those things that you're doing are going to entice them to be on your property. So mm -hmm. I think it's just, I think it's more so of not getting rid of what you love, but familiarizing yourself with snakes a little bit more and trying to get more comfortable to where you can co-mingle with snakes on your property. And that way you can still enjoy mm -hmm. the things you're doing and not have to limit your landscaping and things like that. That's, that's my opinion. And Nancy suggested uh, in your lawn making a path where you keep making a path. Running. Yeah, putting down pavers if you want to create just a walking path, things like that. Yeah. Although, if those if those pavers heat up in the summer, you may find a snake basking on it just you know because it wants to get warm. But again, it's it, there's ways things of like that that I'm happy to talk offline if people need any suggestions, things like that that I've experienced in the past. Here's a question. Do you know if uh, water moccasins are moving northward, um, I guess, with climate change? Right now, we haven't seen anything, and that's why I'm so intrigued when folks uh, say, yeah, I've seen one in Fairfax or I've seen one in this area. Take a picture. I want to see it because if they are moving, there is no data or any surveying that can support it right now. 
Um, so the answer would be no right now, but I would be ecstatic if we ended up finding them up here because I, I love cotton mouths. I love working with them. They're easy to train with. They're very interesting snakes in general. Mm -hmm. and if, they, if there was an opportunity for that to happen, then I'll, you know, I'll support it, but just haven't had any proof of it. Uh, some of our homeowners swear they see them on the Aquaquan River, mm -hmm. but I will, I will give them your. Yes, I would love if you have property that I can get to where you can show me or we can do some type of study. Be... I would love to be able to prove that out. I, I'm not here to say you're wrong and it, it can't happen. I'm just saying that the data provided today does not support that they are this far north. Okay, more questions. Um, can venomous snakes regenerate more venom? Yes, they can. Um, uh, within a 24-hour period, usually, it's depending on the snake species, copperheads can do it very easily. But again, the computer in their brain tells them how much to distribute based on the size of the prey. Mm -hmm. So that way, they're never depleting that. And like I said, copperheads, normally, 40% is all they're going to give. They're going to keep some in reserve in case because they have to to eat. Yep. Okay. What to do if bitten? Anything to add for a pet that's been bitten? I have to say we've had a number of pets in our neighborhood been bitten, including myself. And we took our dog to the emergency vet, and they they did have anti-venom, but it's very expensive. It is very expensive. I, I can only suggest to, to get it, your pets to the vet or get you to the hospital. I, I, there's really no substitute for that, and there's no home remedies. I wouldn't take a chance on it. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, you don't know what type of, you don't know what the venom is going to do to your pets. You don't know what it's going to do to you because mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen very often. So there's not, there's not a ton of information out there, but I wouldn't take a chance on it. Get, get to the vet, get to the hospital as quick as you can and hope that, you know, whatever was bitten got very little. And not very, I, I understand not very many vets carry the anti-venom because it's not very stable. Not every vet does. There are what I would do, and I suggest, and we do this for hospitals. So I would suggest going and calling your vet or local vets in the area to see if you, especially if you're in an area that has a lot of copperheads or a lot of copperhead bites from neighbors, is confirm where they have antivenom. So that way, even though it may not be your vet, they may tell you to go to that vet or they may get the antivenom over to them. We do the same thing for, with hospitals when we're doing venomous snake training. Um, I know Fairfax County, Loudoun County, uh, both Prince William County uh, satellite campuses, uh, Falkier all carry anti-venom for copperheads. So any snake species we use for training, we call around to the local hospitals to ensure in case something happens that one of us was bitten, we can get to the nearest place. Someone mentioned that she had heard to give Benadryl to your pet, but the, I didn't. They didn't tell me to do that. People have posted that before, but I, I honestly would not chance it. I would get to the vet and have the vet tell you what's best for your pet. All right. What are keeled and non-keeled scales? Can you easily tell the difference? Yeah, the, the, the keeled scales are, are more rigid. Like, for example, um, let's see, a hog nose doesn't have very firm, smooth scales. They kind of, they're up, um, they're raised a little bit, I guess. Um, that helps with them when they're digging and things <coughs> like that. So it's more of a rougher snake to where if you were to pick up an eastern rat snake, and if you come to one of my demos, I'd love for everybody to hold one. Um, they're, they're just smooth. You can't even tell there's scales on there, but the keeled ones stick up. They stick out a little bit. They're a little bit more rougher, uh, like a rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes have those as well. Okay, I think that's it, Bill. That was really fantastic. There's a lot of people leaving comments how they learned a lot. Um, yeah. And we, we are going to be sponsoring you in a live event in January, and we will be posting on social media and our, our uh, web page that information. Uh, Nancy asks that you please fill out the evaluation you will receive by email. Okay, we will do. And let me, I just want to plug for our next Zoom. That's Wednesday, November 30th at 11 a.m. And we'll be talking about pollen specialist bees. Nice.
That was great. Thank you. I, I really learned a lot. And oh, um, I think, oh, somebody said the national, one minute, the national snake bite support group on Facebook is awesome. The yes. purpose is to connect snake bite victims with experts. Yes. Yes. And the uh, Nancy mentions that the uh, pollen pollinators talk is with Celia Vaculo. Vaculo. I hope I pronounced that right, Nancy. And I think that was it for today. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, if anyone that you know of or, or that have been bitten by a copperhead in the area or their pets, I, I'd love to talk to that person. Um, I, I learn more about just interacting with folks on their experience. It helps us kind of educate and also helps vets and, and things like that, too, when we're trying to figure out, you know, what it's going to do to someone or someone's pet. But every case seems to be different. And I love hearing about it. So, again, well, my cell phone I, is available if anybody wants to reach out. I'm happy well, to I will reach out because I have personal experience. And then we've had three or four dogs in our neighborhood. Perfect. Love to. Love to. Okay, great. And uh, in the when you we'll get your how to um, get in touch with you when uh, in via email then when okay. the office sends it out. Sounds Thank good. you, Bill. Thank you, you so much. Thank you guys great for time. having me. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank great you. Time. We'll see you, see you guys. See you guys. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. For more information on lawns and gardens, contact the Extension Horticulture Help Desk at mastergardener at pwcva.gov. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.